Hello everyone, welcome back to another lecture. Today's topic will be on pediatrics um, and it is just me delivering the lecture today. Um, and just and the things which we will be covering today include um, MIP, just to talk a little bit about it, moving on to developmental milestones and then to a child who is having a seizure and then ending off with rashes, um, common rashes in children. Um, just to let you know, um, we'll be doing a case-based discussion um, style of presentation. So we'll be talking about um, we'll be talking about each case as it comes along, and then elaborating it a bit more. So um, hope you guys enjoy the lecture. Some definitions before we begin: A child is anyone below the age of eighteen. A neonate is anyone below the age of one. Infant, sorry, neonate below one month old. Infant one year old, and. Then a uh, neonate is considered premature if he or she was born before 37 weeks of gestation. So a little bit about the NIP, also known as the Newborn Infant Physical Examination. It is done within 72 hours of birth, and is often repeated at 68 weeks of life. The purpose of it is to screen for any congenital abnormalities and if, if they are present, to make referrals as soon as possible and if not, just to provide some reassurance for parents. And these are the components of the NIP examination. I'm not going to go through each one in detail because um, it's all here for you to see. I just thought that I would put them all here in the slides so that when you guys want to do them in hospitals yourselves, you can have something to refer to. And for those of you who are in fourth year, you will be you will be having your, your pediatric placements. And when you do, I would highly, highly recommend that you form a NIP yourselves. It is a great examination, takes about 20-30 minutes and you can do it with the midwives. They are done often by the midwives so yeah, try to look for them and I highly recommend that you do it yourself. So it seems like there are a lot of components to this but just stay calm and just start systematically. It is basically a full body examination starting off with a general inspection and then going on to the head, the eyes, the mouth, the the limbs and then the three core systems cardiovascular, respiratory, and abdominal, and then ending off with the lower limbs, genitalia, the spine, and reflexes. One thing I would like to point out though is that in exams they could ask you about the different reflexes present, so sucking, rooting, palmar grass, stepping, and moral. So it's worth noting what each and what each one is um, and how to do it. And I put them in the notes section of this slide. So at the end of it, you can download these slides and refer to them yourselves. So I've got some videos as well um, in the slides. You can have a look at your own time. I won't play it in this lecture just to save your time. But basically, this is the a video of the Barlow and Ortolani's test. Um, you actually do need to push down quite hard for the Barlow test. You, the babies are, are tougher than they than they look. And the last thing you want to miss out a uh, is to miss out a developmental dysplasia of the hip by not pushing down hard enough. So yeah, you actually have to push down quite hard. Um, the midwives will tell you, will guide you with this, so don't worry too much about it. So, back to our favorite celebrity couple. For the first case, we'll be talking about. So, Mr. Co Mr. Trump and Mr. Bonson, as you would have remembered from our previous lecture, at this point decided that they wanted to have children of their own. Um, they decided that the best thing to do would be to adopt a baby um, an Asian baby by the name of Jim Kong On, and from then on, they decided that they wanted the baby to be president of the world, obviously. Um, so they took very careful notes of Kong On's progress and developmental milestones and noted it down in a very tidy table, which I'll get to next. So these are just some videos which I found online of um, developmental milestones of baby. Again, Go, you can go through it at your own time and it's just it's just an excuse for me to put in cute videos of babies in this lecture so the main bulk of the content comes next um, these are the four developmental milestones sort the four developmental domains which are often used when monitoring milestones um, so you start off with two four months moving on all the way up to three years um, I put this table here again more so for your reference. I wouldn't emphasize I wasn't emphasized on memorizing this table because it's way too much information. 
um, what I would say is that for exams, this table right here is more useful. I think a lot of you would have already had this table because I've, I've taken it from one of our lectures, I think given in second year and given again in fourth year. So this is what I would say you would need to remember for exams. Table above just for your own knowledge and I guess if you're a parent or a young parent that could be useful for you too. So some of the things there that perhaps might need some explanation would be something like stranger awareness, where at this point your baby would be aware of strangers are. So I'll give you an example. So about a six month old baby being carried by their parent would be perfectly comfortable. But if you try handing them off to an aunt or an uncle, a person which they've never met before, the, the baby will start crying. And that's what stranger awareness is. Object permanence is when um, you're playing, for example, you're playing with a toy with one with a 12-month, a, a, a one-year-old baby. If you take that toy and hide it behind your back, the baby um, knows that the toy is still there. It's just that you are hiding it. But any, for example, a six-month-old baby, if you hide that toy behind the toy somewhere, they might think that oh, it has just disappeared out of existence and might just completely forget about it. Uh, forget about it. So object permanence means that the baby is aware that an object is there even though they are not able to see it. And I think the rest are pretty self-explanatory. Um, for If you are explaining milestones to parents, I think it's worth mentioning that do not worry too much if your baby aren't hitting these milestones by specific times. There is a range, there's often a range and some babies just might be quicker than quicker or slower than others. So these are some of the red flags you will want to look out for. So a loss of skill at any age is a big red flag. Things like hearing loss, um, low muscle tone, can't hold objects by six months, um, and are just further down the list. So things like a low muscle tone, a floppy baby, and having hand preference before 12 months old could indicate something like cerebral palsy, so you don't want to miss that. And then further milestones you want to take note of will be walking by 18 months um, and walking in speech by 18 months, and I think that's quite important to know as well. And the purpose of taking note of these milestones would be, again, to make sure that any major problems are detected before the age of four. So things like cerebral palsy, sensory neuro hearing loss, visual impairment and learning difficulties. I have to say that with autism, it may be difficult to pick up before the age of four because it's, in terms of autism, it's about the, um, the child's social skills and that may not be quite as apparent um, before the age of four, especially if you have a child who's a bit more on the shy side. So autism might take you a bit more than four years before you can pick it up. Um, but again, it often takes um, specialist involvement to detect that. So moving on to our second case. Um, so this story was obviously written before the lockdown. So they went on a lovely trip to Gunting Highlands. For, for those of you who don't know, Gunting Highlands is um, it's a bit like um, Thorpe Park in Malaysia, except it's somewhere in the mountaintops, so it's really nice and cold up there. But unfortunately, Kong Ong caught a nasty bug and developed a fever and a cold. And one morning, after three days of fever, Kong Ong started to convulse uncontrollably. Um, an ambulance was called for him, but by the time the ambulance had arrived, he had been seizing for the past 10 minutes. So just take note of the time. So if you want, you can pause the video here, have a quick think about the things you would do as a house, as an F1. Um, just write it down, but if not, just continue watching the video. But these are the, the things that you would want to do. Um, as an F1 in a and &E, for example. Um, so you start off with the basics. You start doing A, B, C. Um, airway is really important because with a child who is seizing might have some food or vomit in their mouth, so it's important to make sure that whatever is in their mouth is cleared away immediately. You and then you move on to giving oxygen straight away because even if the sats are high, because seizing uh, takes up a lot of energy. Um, it causes the brain to use up a lot of oxygen and muscles to use up a lot of oxygen. So start giving 15 liters straight away. Um, you would obtain IV access if possible. It might again, it might be difficult. The child is still seizing, but if you do have IV access, get their bloods, 
send them off to the labs, and then start IV lorazepam straight away. Um, because this child has been seizing for 10 minutes. Um, often medication started, af started 5 minutes after, um, after the onset of a seizure. So in this case, 10 minutes, well within range, start IV lorazepam at 0 0.1 mix per gig. Um, the dose varies for adults. I believe it's slightly, it's I believe it's four milligrams for children, for children and adults age 12 and above. But don't quote me on that. Best to check the BNF. But it's slightly different for older children. Um, and then once you start at the IV lorazepam, bring the temperature down with IV paracetamol and inform your senior straight away. Okay, so some further pointers. If the child is still fitting 10 minutes after the first dose of IV lorazepam, you would repeat it once. Again, if, it's, if the child is still fitting after two doses, this is when you would want to start IV phenytoin. And just remember as well, phenytoin is a very dirty drug. So something important to note, when I'm starting IV phenytoin, we do start continuous cardiac monitoring. It's quite cardiotoxic. Last thing you want is to give them a cardiac arrhythmia on top of their seizure. Okay, so status epilepticus, I know there has been quite a lot of confusion in the past, whether it's 5 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, from what I've checked, the most recent guidelines say that it is anything lasting more than 5 minutes, or if they have repetitive seizures without gaining, regaining full consciousness in between them. And the reason why it's been changed from 30 to 5 minutes is because they didn't want people to wait 30 minutes before sort of starting medication or anything like that. Medication started 5 minutes after um, a seizure has started. So they changed that definition so that medication started quicker. And it's to promote aggressive... Um, Pharmacal treatment if a seizure is being if if a seizure has happened for more than five minutes you don't want to wait too long because anything lasting more than five minutes is unlikely to abort spontaneously. So your diagnosis I'm sure all of you know by now it's febrile seizures is what we'll be covering. So febrile seizures are seizures which happen in young children triggered by fever often more than thirty eight point three degrees Celsius. It occurs between the ages of 6 to months and it peaks at 2 years old and is often accompanied by other childhood illnesses. They are generally brief and generalized, so they, you have full body convulsions, and about 40% will have a recurrence. And the majority of the children do not develop epilepsy. Okay? Brain waves and imaging, so EEGs, MRIs, are not necessary unless you have a seizure that is very prolonged, if the seizure begins focally, for example, starting off in one arm before moving on to the rest of the body, or you have any other concerns on examination. So that will include something like meningitis, for example. So true or false, a prolonged initial febrile seizure substantially increases the risk of recurrent febrile seizures. Um, the answer to that is false. It does not increase the risk of recurrent febrile seizures. What it does increase is that if you have one prolonged febrile seizure, the next febrile seizure which you have, if you do if you do get it, will be prolonged as well. So the duration is increased, but not the frequency. How common are febrile seizures? It is actually the most common type of convulsions in young children, and it happens about two to five percent of children before the age of five. Um, some factors which increase the risk of recurrence is if they have their first febrile seizure before 18 months. They have a family history of febrile seizures, a febrile seizure as the first sign of illness, or a rel relatively low temperature. So it could even be a normal body temperature, which increases with their first febrile seizure. And most cases of febrile seizures do not cause any long-term damage. Just a bit of a quick question here. So... The chances, what chances, of that's what chances does the child with a history of simple febrile seizure have of developing epilepsy later on in life? And the answer to that is one in fifty. So it is actually not as high as what some people think. The baseline rate for a normal population would be one in a hundred. So yes, it is double, but it is not as high. However, 
if a child has a complex febrile seizure, the risk of developing epilepsy goes up, and it goes up quite a bit to about 1 in 20 to 1 in 10. And to the two, the way we would sort of categorize the two types of febrile seizures into simple and complex would be it would be simple if they meet all of the following criteria. So, like I said, full body convulsions, less than five minutes, and no more than once in 24 hours. But if any of the following factors are present, it's considered as complex, and I think you would worry a bit more about that. So, if it starts focally, it lasts more than 15 minutes, or it occurs more than once in a 24-hour period. Principles of management, um, so treatment would mainly be directed to the, towards the cause of the fever, be it a chest or an ear infection. You can give paracetamol, ibuprofen to bring down the temperature, but that is only for comfort, comfort purposes um, because they do not prevent the febrile seizures from happening, whereas benzodiazepines will, can be given to prevent, to reduce the risk of febrile seizures. So what in most cases, what's done is that bacomdazolam or rectodazolam can be prescribed as a rescue medication. One can be given, for example, if prophylactically, if the parent knows that their child is very prone to febrile seizures, can give the bacomdazolam or rectodazolam prophylactically to prevent the seizures from happening in the first place. Or if, again, it does happen and it's lasting more than five minutes, that's when you would start medication. So this is just something I found online. Um, I decided to include it because, I don't know, it could be one of those questions that Bart likes to ask where, you know, you're in the exams you always have that one question that just makes you go, what the heck, how is this here? We never covered it in the syllabus, so I feel like this could be something that Bart asks. So don't worry about it. If you get it wrong, the answer is temporal lobe epilepsy. And just know that TLE is actually very difficult to treat. Um, but don't, I wouldn't go into much more detail than this. It's just okay. Um, so this actually came out as an Oski station for me in fourth year. So um, advising a parents on what to do um, for when they've brought their child in with a febrile seizure for the first time. Okay. Ask ask them to stay calm during the seizure. I know it can be difficult but try their best to stay calm, note the time, and record the seizure if possible. If they are able, put the child in the recovery position, but do not restrain or hold the child during a convulsion, because that is actually more dangerous. Try not to put anything in your mouth, for example, your finger, but if you need to give them buckle dazlem, you can try to just press it against their cheek, avoiding the teeth. And then call the ambulance if this is a first seizure, if it's lasting more than five minutes, or your child does not seem to be recovering quickly. And what this means is that, so with every seizure, um, a full body um, generalized seizure, you would get a post tictal state where the child would be confused, a bit tired, a bit blurry, but they should bounce back quite quickly. If it seems like your child's not recovering quickly enough, it might be worth calling an ambulance as well. Start treatment if it's lasting for more than five minutes, and after the seizure's settled, bring your child to the doctor to determine the cause of the fever. So, third case, now moving on to a bit of dermatology. So he's now five years old and living in a germ-free bubble. Um, and the parents being overprotective has decided to keep him as clean as possible. And one day, um, the da um, Kong's dad noticed um, excoriation marks on the flexural surface of his elbows and knees. Um, he decided to just rub some salt on it because why not salt kills everything. Um, but that made him scream again. The neighbor had to um, rescue them and, and advise them to bring their child to the GP. Okay, so this is what it looks like. I'm sure many of you know what this is. Apologize for the poor picture quality, but it's the best we got. Uh, this is could be eczema, could be atopic dermatitis. But for the lecture, for today's lecture, we'll be going. <coughs> uh, we'll be just elaborating more about it. So, some, some introduction before we move on to the clinical side of things. Um, atopic dermatitis, so eczema, is the, um, it's due to the defect in the epidermal barrier. 
it's also a defect in innate in, in immune response and it has a genetic component to it. Some risk factors include family history of atopy um, and it also it also is a cutaneous hyperactivity to various environmental stimuli. So environment does have a role. In terms of diagnosis, it is mostly a clinical diagnosis. And um, mostly clinical diagnosis and it is often done by the GP. Okay? So sorry, if any of you are confused earlier, atopic dermatitis is eczema, they're the same thing. It's just a fancy way of calling it. Okay, so this is the UK Working Party's diagnostic criteria for, for eczema. Do not try to memorize this, it's not that important. Just put this here in case any of you are interested. Um, but just know that's mostly a clinical, mostly a clinical diagnosis, often done by GP. Okay, some fancy dermatology terms. So those of you who haven't done your dermatology placement, do not worry, you will cover each and every one of these terms when you do it. Our dermatologies, uh, we have excellent, excellent dermatology handouts. So if you can, go print them out. And that's all I studied for dermatology anyway. So if acute, you have these features. You have chronic, you have these features. So just remember the two to help you differentiate. But if you think of it um, logically, acute, you're constantly scratching. There's a lot of fluid. There's a lot of um, itchiness. Um, and you have fluid leaking out, so egg stations. So whereas it's chronic, it, everything is dried up, it becomes scaly, and you have things like plaques. Um, and what's more, more important to note is the distribution, because it actually varies from young children to older ones. So from children below the age of two tends to have it on their extensive surfaces, whereas children older than that and adults will have it on their flexural surfaces. Don't ask me why this is the case, but it's that's it. Um, below two extensors, above two flexures. So how would you start? How would you treat Kong Ong? What would you do? And because this is quite clear cut, atopic dermatitis, I think we could say that it's quite safe to start him on some steroids and um, emollient steroid away. Um, so these are the two mainstay treatments of eczema. Um, and what if you think of it logically, eczema is dry, itchy skin. If you have to explain it to someone, to a layperson, it's dry, itchy skin. If you keep the skin moist and well hydrated, it shouldn't be itchy. Therefore, we would advise using moisturizers as much as possible. You want the skin to, to just be as wet as possible. So apply moisturizers every day um, as, as often as you can remember. Um, you can have special shower, chef special um, formulations that you can use in the bath as well. Um, so yes, and we would advise it to um, to moisturize after, like once you've stepped out of the shower, because um, just moisturize straight away. Um, in terms of steroids, that's often reserved for cases of acute flare-ups. Um, and you, will, would, you wouldn't want to use it that liberally because there are some quite strong side effects. So some of the principles of management would be you want to identify the severity and the impact on the patient's quality of life. And those two factors are important in determining the severity. So this is what the IgA looks like. Um, again, I didn't, we, didn't, we don't have this in our handouts, so I thought I'd put it here for you to have a look. Um, and then... This is what the sort of treatment ladder is. Um, but just know that in terms of treatment, moisturizers, steroids, those are two main important things. Um, if you want, you can just go by this table as sort of a guide, but don't. Of the, in the case of eczema, your patient is your best teacher. So you want to start the steroids off relatively low and scale it up according to how they need it. Some adjunct therapies would be um, antibiotics, antifungals, depending on if there is an infection super superimposed onto the eczema. And you can give them some sedating antihistamines as well to help them sleep at night if they start itching at night. Um, okay, so steroids are your main, your best friend, especially when it comes to um, acute flare-ups acute flare of eczema. 
So you would want to start off with the lowest potency of steroid before moving up because you starting someone um, on a high dose straight away wouldn't leave you much options to scale up. So start low and then move up. You would advise them to apply um, once to twice a day, try not to do it more than that. And once they've been on steroids for a very long time, you would advise them to not tape, to not stop immediately. So try tapering off. Um, so from twice a day to once a day to maybe once every two days. Don't stop straight away. In terms of how much to apply, it's determined by something called fingertip unit. But just remember, one fingertip unit, which is the tip of the finger to the first crease, can be used for an area equivalent to two palms. That's the estimate you would give. And just note that there are some side effects to steroids, which are skin atrophy, hyperpigmentation, and if you use it for really long and you use too much of it, it can lead to some systemic side effects. <clears throat> and the rule is, rule of thumb, is to use the least potent, most effective steroid for the shortest period of time possible. So that would be, in most cases, um, from what I know, is that you would start someone off on hydrocortisone before trying something strong. So hydrocortisone is actually quite mild. Um, and for stronger steroids, um, you would want to avoid the face, the axilla, and groin creases because those are quite sensitive areas, and you don't want those areas to, to you don't want to put such too too strong of a steroid on those areas. Um, I believe your handouts would have the different types of steroids, so I won't go through them. So just on to our last case presentation now. Um, it's a little bit about dermatology in childhood, and there is a very excellent table provided by my colleague, um, which I think you guys would find quite useful for exams. So the next few slides are all about just some lectures for you, uh, just some questions for you to do, um, and they're all dermatology related, so I won't go through each one, um, but the answers and the explanations are again in the notes section. So if you want to do it yourself and you want to know what each one is, um, download the slides and they're all in the notes section. Okay, so just gonna skim through these ones. Don't worry about them, they're all in the notes section. Have a look at your own time. But just want to let you know as well that different types of rashes and different types of things you want to look out for, and these are some of the common viral, bacterial, and just might some of the rashes that might prevent in childhood. Um, I think I've said enough for this lecture, so you don't want to, I won't go through each and every one of these rashes in detail. And I think this table summarizes it quite clearly what you need to know for your exams. So I think that's, yeah, that's the end of our lecture. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hope you guys found this useful and hope you guys will have a great summer ahead. All the best for the upcoming year.